Welcome to Cannabis Investing Newsletter. I'm D.H. Taylor. Today, a lot going on. Stock market opened up the Dow down about 400 for the day. There's a lot going on in the background, and it's all inflation. This is some something I've been covering over the past couple of days. We lost about 5%. Uh, last week in about two days worth of sessions moved up a little bit beyond that then it just kind of sort of collapsed from there uh we are already at the lows of where we were last week if you're just looking at a a, a short-term chart there i do expect continued selling for cannabis investors this is an opportunity to pick up some great stocks with value don't look at the charts i keep saying this over and over again the price you pay today is the value you get tomorrow. So ask yourself a simple question. Whatever you're buying today, what value is that stock going to provide for you? How much earnings, whether it be EBITDA or the potential thereof, net earnings, things like this. And this applies to everything across the board. Whether you're looking at tech, um, if you're looking at healthcare, uh, any of the other sectors, energy, whatever. So I want to kind of Quickly look at some of the things that are going on in the stock market, some of the things that are bringing in uh, the, the pain, if you will, that's selling the stock market off. But what I really want to cover today is what is EBITDA? I use this term often. Pretty much every single article and video I put together, I'm mentioning EBITDA. And there's a reason behind it. Uh, EBITDA is important for a newer company that is just getting started and just getting to certain levels. So before we get into a bit, uh, let's take a look at some of the charts that we've got go going on and what's happening. Here's a quick look at the chart. This is the sell-off we saw last week, pushing all the way, uh, the S&P 500, all the way down almost to 4,000. Uh, bounced up a little bit over the past couple of days, and then this morning, it was just all blood. A, a little bit of blood. We're getting there. I do believe we're going to see a little more selling and this is all driven by inflation with interest rate fears. The thing is with interest rates, and let's go ahead and pull up a 10-year note, we've been trending higher and higher, but we're seeing interest rate concerning economic data keep continually popping in. And this will affect all stocks across the board in almost identical ways because if interest rates go higher, yield that you're getting from your investments goes lower. That means, uh, so your future earnings per share multiple that you use, you're going to have to adjust that going into um, future projections. If ye interest rates go higher, that yield goes lower. Therefore, the stocks will start to sell off. I'm expecting 1.7 to be breached on the 10-year note. I do expect we'll probably be seeing over the course of, say, the next six months, maybe a move all the way up to 2%. Uh, this will take some time. As long as we um, don't see anything really disconcerting, however, last week we did see inflation hit about 4%. But here's the thing with the 4% interest rate, uh, inflation rates. The year before, we hit a 0%. Now this year, we're hitting 4%. And the reason why we hit 0% on inflation is simple. The, the economy shut down to almost zero momentarily. Uh, April, May time period. Then from that period, we're now restarting things and in, uh, inflation's jumping back up based upon a number that was near zero. So if you average the two over the course of those two years, it's only a 2% inflation rate. That's a little more palatable. And it may be that the Federal Reserve looks at that and says, well, let's get some more information before we start making hawkish statements. And when they say hawkish, they mean raising interest rates. So uh, I can see the 10-year trending higher with moderation, given the information we have right now. But if we continue to get uh, information that says more inflation is coming, that's going to be disconcerting. We're about to hit the driving season. The driving season, of course, you know, the summer months, there's an expectation that a lot of Americans are going to get out there and kind of do something because we've all been locked up for the past year. Given that, there are going to be demands on oil prices and gasoline that the system probably can't handle right now. 
that is going to push price up. There may be shortages. There may be things like that going on. That will be inflationary. That acts as a tax on the consumer. So we may be buying more gas, but then we're spending a little less at the restaurant uh, that we're going to. We'll see how that plays out. Again, economics is not an event. It's a process. You're continually getting information. And investment is pretty much the same thing. It's not a one-time event where you sit there and say, you know what, today's the day I'm going to buy. You make decisions over a longer period of time and you hold that investment over a long period of time. It's a process, not an event. Let's get into EBITDA. So what is EBITDA and why is it important? EBITDA, first off, E-B-I-T-D-A, earnings before interest, taxation, depreciation, and amortization. So you basically have a few metrics that you want to keep an eye on with a brand new company. And mind you, a company like, say, Apple, Tesla, Microsoft, whatever, they're net profitable at this point. So you don't really pay attention to a bit of profitability too much just yet. Uh, a bit would probably come into play more often with when you're looking at companies that have higher depreciation rates in certain asset groups and amortization or maybe tax brackets or if they're paying a lot in interest um, for carrying a lot of debt. Only companies that are mature would you look at EBITDA at that point based upon those metrics. But for, say, cannabis stocks that are just starting out, EBITDA profitability is the first metric that we're looking for. So you have your top line, you've got your uh, cost of goods, and then you have what's called sales channel administrative. EBITDA, when we look at operating costs, removes a pre, uh, depreciation and amortization. Now let's take a look at some things here. First, you get your top line revenue. How much did you sell? If you sold, say, $1 million worth of product for the quarter, the month, the period, whatever it is, that's your top line revenue. And we'll say top line, we'll say bottom line, things of this nature. The next thing we do is we ask the question, okay, you sold a $1 million worth of product. What was the cost of those goods? Now, the cost of goods allows us to see what the gross margins are. Cost of goods are the input costs that they have, the company would have, for creating that product. Let's say it's a pre-roll. There's basically three, four product, uh, four costs involved there. There's the paper, there's the cannabis that goes inside it, packaging, and maybe labor. You may look at some like fertilizers and things like this. That would all be cost of goods. Um, you may, since it is a cannabis product, you may say the electricity is involved in that because electricity is actually the, one of the highest costs you're going to see with a grow facility because they're running these lights maybe 24 hours a day. So we figure out where cost of goods are. You subtract that. That leaves you your gross profits. And you can then determine what your gross uh, margin is based upon your gross profits. Next, we've got sales general administrative, the back office, the rent on the building, salaries, um, marketing costs, things like this. But this section here, sales general administrative, are in what's called the total operating costs. So the top portion of the financial statement deals with the product and revenue. The next portion deals with total operating costs. Those total operating costs often include depreciation and amortization. So when we talk about EBITDA, we take those out of there to give us what is called total operating profits. From total operating profits, that's basically EBITDA. You've got your top line. What did you sell? Cost of goods. How much did it cost to produce that product? The one guy out on the sh machine shop who's rolling the pre-rolls, however it works out, um, and then the rent on the facility plus the management's uh, fees and selling and things like this. That is EBITDA. Then we look at 
interest, taxation, depreciation, and amortization, which would then get us to net profitability or negative. Um, beyond that, so the depreciation and amortization is one of the things we're kind of keying in on. But beyond that, you'll need to kind of break things down. Now, I have a chart here on Halo Collective, just released yesterday. Uh, what is the, the 18th of May, for those who might catch this a couple days late. Here is their um, uh, their breakdown of their financial. And what we're going to be looking at first is top line revenues. You can see cost of goods right here. Then you can see uh, just underneath that um, gross profits. So basically you have your top line revenue. How much did they sell? How much did it cost them to sell that product? Here's your gross profit. I can determine what gross margins are from this. But then we move downward and we want to start looking at, so you'll see general administrative salaries and things like this. Every company is going to kind of break this down differently. But we do see depreciation in here, and that's the one we want to kind of take out. I don't see amortization in this uh, in itself, so this would get us to a bit of profit once we remove the depreciation from there. There may or may not be some other lines moving out of there, but this gives us an idea as to what we're looking for. I've got a more kind of uh, blown up screen here. So from revenues, we're looking at uh, 9.6 uh, with 7.7 .7 on cost of goods. This gives us a gross profit of 2.2 for Halo for Q1 2021. Moving on down, they'll have to adjust for fair value. They have basically what's inventory, how much weed they got in the back of the store sitting there on the shelves. They adjust in and out quarter to quarter. How much did they sell? Did they have to write anything off? This would go against your gross margins and it shows up in your gross profit section. Then, as I said, we break down all these metrics right here, which gives us, um, we're close to a bit to at that point, but depreciation needs to come out. Let's move forward on one more. Here we go. General administrative, salaries, professional fees, sales and marketing, investor relations. I figured that would just be Kieran sitting there texting people. Um, loss of on settlements and contingencies zero there, share-based compensation. All these are expenses that will remain in total operating expenses. Depreciation, of course, uh, gets removed. Interest expenses, you would take that one out again. EBITDA, earnings before interest taxation. So, But they don't have any amortization in this one, and it's probably because we're dealing with a company that's fairly new and they've not amortized anything. Not all companies will have amortization. But this gives us one quick example as to whether or not the core concept of this business is going to function. You've got your revenue. You've got the cost of goods, which was how much it cost to actually produce that revenue. Then you've got running the entire business, total operating costs. When we get to a EBITDA, we ask the question, is this a company that can make it? That's the first barrier we're looking for, or the first hurdle we're looking for. If their core concept is working and they get to a bit of profitability, oftentimes it's now a matter of, well, they need more volume because then you get marginal profits. Let's say Joe down on the floor is... Uh, producing however many, but now all of a sudden, instead of 1,000 units in a week, he might be doing, say, 1,100 units in a week. But he's not really um, costing the firm too much more. He's just being more productive during that period of time. These are economies of scale. This is productivity gains. So he doesn't cost, he, he, maybe he's working on an hourly rate, 20 bucks an hour, trimming some bud, whatever it is he's doing down on the floor, but he's producing more at the same exact cost. So we're looking at economies of scale. We're looking at productivity gains. So once we know EBITDA, then it's a matter of, well, will 
economies of scale get this company to a higher level to cover things like taxation, interest, depreciation, amortization, so that we can get to net profitability. If we look here down with um, Halo Collective, they lost $9 million on $9 million in revenue. Not exactly stellar, but they're in a their their revenues are trending upwards, and we are looking for some good news coming out of Halo. Uh, as it turns out, Halo Collective, although you can't really see it on this particular chart, just the way the charts printing, but one of the top movers for the day, they're up about 13% for the day. Um, I think their earnings report was positive, and I do see some continued move upward interestingly i got an email from a gentleman by the name of uh, ned just yesterday and he asked me about this company uh high tide they just uplisted to the ot uh from the otc to the next level which was be nasdaq they are they saw some some increases and the thing is with uplisting to nasdaq you get a lot of bigger players that are now able to get into the stock. Hedge funds with one, ten, a hundred billion dollars aren't looking at thirty million dollar companies to get involved in. It's especially if they're on the OTC looking at pink slips. There's no liquidity for these guys. These guys are going to want to drop a hundred million dollars into a company. So when your valuation is all of fifty million a hedge fund simply is going to kind of take a back step on some of these smaller companies. As it turns out, two things happen. When High Tide listed on the NASDAQ, this was very positive for the stock because now a lot more players can get in. There's a lot more liquidity, things like this. However, today's news, they are looking at raising some capital and they increase the number of shares are going to be issuing and the dollar amount that they're issuing from that was dilutive. The stock has sold off. They are at this time the uh, biggest, I guess we could say, loser for the day with this down move. I see High Tide as being a very positive company. Yeah, they need some cash and it does look dilutive. Nonetheless, it's very possible that their stock continues lower and this would be an excellent buying opportunity i've been looking at high tide between four to six dollars as a buying target um we might hit that a little quicker nonetheless wanted to say thanks for stopping by every day monday through friday i've been kind of putting out some kind of information more on a uh, how to learning basis what's going on with the economy what's going on with the stock market how everything plays in then i transfer that into cannabis stocks I got a core group of individuals who, quite honestly, probably watch every single video out there. And that's exactly the target, if you will. Those individuals who are getting involved in cannabis stock investing aren't certain on a couple things. And I'm trying to provide this information on a daily basis. If you are getting involved in, say, tech stocks or healthcare, or whatever, I'm hopeful that I can provide this kind of information for you. You can say, well, I'm not going to invest in a cannabis stock, but I am going to invest in this. And that information is exactly what I'm trying to learn. So it's kind of a more general, broad video. Uh, free email newsletter just below. Feel free to subscribe. Also, for those, excuse my reach, I am also not only an analyst, I am also a master coffee roaster. I got a group of guys out of California that are roasting some coffee for me, free shipping. Please, by all means, try out my coffee. Um, this is not exactly orange mocha frappuccino kind of coffee, nor is it gas station coffee on the other end of the spectrum where it's very, very dark roasted, sort of right in the middle, sort of a medium roast. I am leaving the country, heading back down to Mexico so I can chase down some more farms to to be roasting i appreciate the support get the free email newsletter links are down below also try my coffee we'll see you in the next video